Hello, fellow book lovers, both readers and writers. I am Maddie Dallarnbull. I'm the author of the Anne Kinner Suspense Novels and Suspense Shorts and the Lizzie Ballard Thrillers. And I also write, speak, consult, and podcast on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. And you can find out more about me at maddiedallarnbull.com and at theindieauthor.com. And this is my video series, What I Learned, where I ask authors two questions about their latest book. What did they learn from their latest book that they'd like to share with their fellow writers? And what did they learn from their latest book that they'd like to share with their fellow readers? And I am here today with Julie Rogers. Hey, Julie, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. To give our viewers a little bit of background on you, Julie Rogers is the author of books across a wide range of fiction and nonfiction genres, including Seven Shorts, Letters, Sidereal Insight for a 21st Century Mystic, Hootie, and When Pigs Fly Over the Moon. She received the 1999 Writer's Digest Writing Competition Grand Prize for her horror short story, House Call. Julie also works as a freelance ghostwriter, editor, and consultant for fiction, nonfiction, blog, screenplay, and technical projects. She's a member of the Independent Book Publishers Association and the Editorial Freelancers Association, and her latest book is Falling Stars. And so today I am asking Julie two what I learned questions about Falling Stars, starting with what did you learn from your latest book that you'd like to share with your fellow authors? Thank you, Maddie. Oh, yes, I could go through many things, but mainly in this book project, I outlined in a different way. What I wrote when I was younger, in my 20s, 30s, sometimes I would fly by the seat of my pants. Sometimes I would be the fast track rider, sometimes a slow track rider. This one was a slow track. It had a lot of history in it, a lot of research. And I think as I've gotten older, I have become more paranoid. I look up everything. So it took a, a long time. And because it was taking longer than I originally anticipated, I decided, you know, I know where the story is going. I know the beginning, middle, and end. But I'm stuck because I haven't put myself on a schedule. And so my outline became much more about putting myself on a schedule and staying to it. And so the way I did it was not using the outline that I typically use when I work with clients or with myself. And this is sort of a, a grid of it. Basically, it's based on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And there's an act one, two, and three. So you could use it to write a screenplay or a stage play or a 12-chapter book. Now, you could actually have more chapters than that, but the way the grid is outlined is for 12 chapters. So the first four chapters happen in Act 1 and so forth. And in this grid, what I encourage my class to do is for each act to only pick three. There are actually about 12 major movements in each act. For instance, in Act 1, we have either the dilemma the cause or the fear. Those are three out of 12 that you could answer. And then in Act 2, the struggle, tit for tat, or the first response. And then in Act 3, the lesson, the victory, or the loss. And then there's actually more than that. I'm just giving you three examples. Of course, you know that Joseph Campbell's journey, you start out in the ordinary world, you have a call to his venture, you have the refusal and then the mentor and so forth, all the way down to the hero returning with the elixir of change. And so this typically is what I'm thinking about when I do a story or when I, you know, work with someone with a story. But I threw all that out the window this time because <laughs> what had happened was I had originally outlined this and written Fallen Stars as a screenplay. And I had written the first act, the first 30 pages in 2001, went over to the Maui Writers Convention, and I pitched it to Allison Rosenwald. She was one of the producers of Wind Talkers that was coming out that next year. She didn't take it. I pitched a bunch to her. It was like a you know, five-minute pitch, and, and this was one that got, got shelved. But I put it on my bucket list. And so 20 years later, I set up to write it. But what I realized was I was spending the first two months on the prologue alone. And I'm like, I'll never get finished if I keep doing this. It had 18 chapters, epilogue and prologue. So, you know, I had to get going. So what I did was it took me maybe two or three days to do this. I think, you know, working pretty much all day. 
but I just did a plain word outline, prologue, chapter one, so forth, and then bulleted the points, you know, what the major action that was going to happen in each sequence. And I added a month to it. In other words, over here, you can see this is chapter 12, July. In other words, for the month of July, I was working on that chapter. And what I found was, once I got into this, I could actually get a couple of chapters done a month. But like I said, slow writing one chapter a month. And the thing that I was concerned about in doing it this way was that I would hang too closely to the outline and I wouldn't find those nice little twists and turns and aha, that it would destroy my creativity, in other words. Because I had ghost written for a client who was a great outline, just like this. Here's my action item. Boom, boom, boom. This is what I want you to write. And I knew with that particular client, I had to stay right with how they outlined it. I only had a little bit of wiggle room in terms of, you know, your character, you're kind of going out of character here and why. Maybe we should look at this action item and make sure that you're still matching the character blow that you started with. Would they really do this in this situation and why? But anyway, it was, you know, a very static form of outlining. So at first this scared me, but what surprised me about it was even though I had a very specific outline and action items to do in this story, I kept going off on bunny trails. And it, it was like the ahas just kept coming to me. But what would happen is I had the firm outline. I knew where I had to get back to. And it worked. And it worked. And the people who have reviewed this book have said 39, 2023, and went back and forth between them, multiple points of view. And I actually had all of my characters reading one central online magazine called Felix Argosy about a vampire. So they each were coming out of this chapter of reading it with their own response. And so that was very, very complex. And this outline saved me. But it also saved me in the sense that I had boxed myself in and I wanted to have this book finished by December 2022. Yeah. As I had to have it finished by then because I wanted to publish in May before the action started happening in November 2023, which is yet to come. So I had it all outlined in my head how I wanted it to happen. And this very simple form of outlining help. So if I had another complex book like this to do it in, I would do it just like this. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Both, I mean, much of that is interesting, but I think it's interesting that you not only had the chronology that was going on in the story to coordinate, but the chronology of your production and publication schedule to factor in. That's, I don't often hear about that. Well, and you know, that was really, I, I've even said to other interviewers that was a stupid thing to do to box myself in and say this has to happen in 2023 but what i was dealing a lot with was i had a, an immunocompromised boy and i was trying to decide in my mind how this whole pandemic fallout was going to look and would people still be wearing masks and how much you know how many residual modifications and mutations of this COVID-19 were we going to see? And so I was looking ahead in history and going, how far out or should you date it? And I finally decided, yeah, I'm going to date it. It starts in November 2023 and it goes through February 2024, basically the book itself. So, you know, I, uh, that was an, another reason for the outlining is I knew I had boxed myself in and I knew I had to get it done. I had to get it to the editor in December. And I said, he'll have it a month and he'll get it back to me and I'll, and sure enough, January, had it done, had the publicist started. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think that that consideration of whether or not, for example, to date it explicitly and how you handle the environment of COVID is a nice transition to the other question I want to ask, which is, what did you learn from the book that you'd like to share with your fellow readers? 
Yes. Well, you know, I had a real interesting experience because I had my first book signing in Eureka Springs. And the book is set in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The whole history of Eureka Springs, much like any of the areas of America that have the healing springs, is the water. And that's where why everybody went there starting in the late 1800s. The Indians, the Osage Indians, introduced the white settlers. They came in by the drove to sit in the waters, drink the waters, etc. And a lot of them died, but a lot of them lived and recovered. So it became known as this area for healing. And all of the original hotels were sanatoriums. Um, a lot of doctors converged on that area, especially the notorious Norma G. Baker. Now, he was a shyster. He was a mentalist, a, a like, vaudeville uh, actor. And he came in and bought the Crescent Hotel at a time when it was empty, broke. And he created this hospital, a cure for cancer hospital. So in my story, I have my sick vampire. He's not a well vampire. He's a sick vampire coming from Cardiff to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, to Norman Baker's hospital. And the irony is Norman Baker didn't really cure anyone. He took a lot of money from people, but the vampire is cured through one of his doctors that he has working for him. So, you know, it, and I sat in Eureka Spring at my first book signing, and it was hosted by a book club, and then all read Falling Stars. One of the members came up and said, I'm reading it a second time. I love it. You know, it, it was That's very, nice. it was very confirming. But one of the ladies who hosted it was very curious, and we had a, a wonderful conversation. And from a reader standpoint, I just, you know, I ate it up. I loved it because she was asking me, okay, now, you know, Tommy and June's home, they're my major characters. She said, now, is that an actual house? Is that actually here? I said, no. I said, I was very careful not to pick homes with numbers. I went with Google and went actually went there many, many times, you know, walked the neighborhoods, made sure that I wasn't converging on anyone's privacy. But as far as the other elements in that story, I really, really researched them over the years. My husband and I have gone there every year since 1999. And it was for medical conventions. He's a physician. And so we would go for the DO medical conventions there and then for vacation. So every year I would pick up stories, you know, visit the Carnic Library, look at the research and just the whole history of Eureka Springs is so rich, even beyond the healing waters. So as I sat with that reader and she was asking these different questions, I was trying to explain to her that with my background in journalism, I try to set a big element or a tone of realism in my stories. And I, I wanted to in this point, I read Eureka Springs is a real place. These are real buildings. But yet walking that tightrope with, again, people's privacy and being careful with putting on my HR hat and being careful what businesses am I going to patronize or not patronize in my book? Uh, that sort of thing. So all of those elements had to come in when, you know, when creating a story that is not in a completely fictional world with completely fictional names and items. So when you a lot of responsibility. Yeah. yeah. When you included the name of an actual place, did you ever alert the people or ask them or let them know subsequently that they were starring in a book, like a bakery or whatever it might be? Yes, absolutely. I did. I, you know, I wanted to pick even businesses that are newer there, getting started, that sort of thing. But I didn't for this reason, because in Eureka Springs, there's a lot of being at now being a destination vacation. There is a lot of coming and going of businesses and relocating. 
So I did some of the tried and true businesses that had been there for years and years, a couple of restaurants that had been there for years and years. And of course, we would always go eat there when we were there. So we would talk to, uh, and, and some of those same waiters and waitresses, you know, still there, still working there, cooks. And so other books have been written about those places. So they're very used to that. But yeah. yet at the same time, there's that excitement too. There's yeah. been a lot written about your Springs, mainly about the history and the water and that sort of thing. Not ever a contemporary fictional account that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's a little bit new. Well, it all sounds very intriguing. I, I love your description. I love your the approach you took to get it get it complete. I love hearing about some of the reception that it's received. So, Julie, thank you so much for talking about what you learned from Falling Stars. Please let the viewers know where they can go to find out more about you and your books and everything you do online. Absolutely. You know, Amazon.com and my uh, own website, julierogersbooks.com. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.